Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Sebastian. Um, today I'm going to talk about code execution, external code execution in Android. And um, this is about work that I did with Yannick Frat Antonio, Antonio Bianchi, Christopher Krügel, and Giovanni Vigna. So, what is the problem? The basic issue is that apps that run on your Android phone can load external code at any time without any permission. So um, if your app has internet permission, it can download stuff, code, Java code, native code, whatever it wants, and load it and execute it. So um, there are different techniques that this can be done. We're going to talk about them shortly. But um, there are two, um, one good and one bad side to it. So the good thing is the permissions that your app has are also enforced on external code that it loads. But the bad news is there are no additional checks. So, so the system in particular does not check where the code comes from if the code is trusted. There's no check whatsoever on the external code. So let's look at why this is a problem. There are two scenarios where this can be really problematic. The first is um, considering malicious apps. You probably all know that um, malware protection in the Android world is mostly centralized. So um, most protection systems run at a central place, like the App Store, where apps are analyzed before they are distributed to users. Um, those of you who are actually developing malware protection that runs on Android phones know that um, the system res restricts you very much in what you can do there. So um, given the central centralized nature of malware protection in Android, it is really problematic that an app once installed on the user's phone can actually download arbitrary code and execute it. So um, this is sort of a conceptual problem. The second scenario, and this is what I'm going to focus on in this talk, is um, benign applications. They have different reasons to also use this code loading feature. We're going to see the reasons soon. And the problem is, as I said, the system does not conduct any integrity checks on the code that is loaded from the internet. So the apps technically have to do that themselves. Sadly, they don't. So. Um, we have dangerous vulner vulnerabilities arising from that. Now let's first look at um, funny ways to exploit this feature. So the first thing is um, Google Bouncer. You might know that Google Bouncer is the system that Google introduced after some malware got into the, the App Store. And it's supposed to um, keep out all the, the nasty stuff. So what we did was write a very simple app that just has a button to download. It can download external code and execute it. And the bouncer did nothing to prevent us from publishing it on the store. Actually, um, someone told me that Google only starts checking those apps when they get more popular. But even then, it, um, we can discuss whether this is any sort of protection. I mean, there's still ways to fingerprint the bouncer then and serve malicious code. So um, actually, the, the last line is very important, the remark. We did not use that <laughs> on, uh, on users. So the second one is um, Gun Zombie is some game from Google Play. Um, the game itself, I don't know much about. The interesting thing is that it uses an advertisement framework called App Lovin. And App Lovin has a feature to self-update. So the reason is that um, those frameworks are integrated into applications by the developers of those applications. And now AppLovin might publish a new version of the framework, but the gun zombie developers do not integrate it into their app. But still, AppLovin wants to have the latest version of their framework run on all the user's devices. So what they do is they just give their framework a self-update mechanism that works independently of updates from uh, Google Play. Now, as you can see, the problem is that um, the framework downloads updates from the internet via HTTP, which might not be a really good idea. So um, what we did was just man in the middle of the download and inject arbitrary code. So just by 
having control over, for example, the DNS resolution, you can make users that have this app installed execute arbitrary code. Another attack that we did was um, a certain popular framework that we're not going to name. I should have said for, the, for AppLovin, we contacted the developers of the framework and they immediately confirmed the vulnerability and um, provided a patch within hours. So by now it should be deployed to most apps. From uh, the developer of this framework, we did not get any reactions, so we're not going to name them in order to protect the users. The concept of this framework is that it is installed as a standalone app, and every app that is based on the framework is just a separate app. And they use the standalone app's name to load the code of this framework. Now the problem is that the developers apparently assume the name is a unique property. It's not. So um, just by installing an app with the same name but being first, you can again make apps load arbitrary code. Okay, after having seen what um, code loading can do, we wanted to know how prevalent is it in benign apps? How many vulnerabilities are there? So what we did was um, we tried to find out how many benign apps actually use the code loading techniques that there are and how many of them are doing it the wrong way. We looked at roughly one and a half thousand apps from Google Play, each with more than one million installations. So we picked popular apps, random popular apps. And also we looked at the top 50 from uh, November 2012 and August 2013 to um, get an idea if this is just a problem of, of cheap, crappy apps or if it's also a thing in, in large and allegedly well-developed apps. We used static analysis. I'm going to um, talk about that in a minute. So first, we identified the different ways that one can load code in Android. So probably the most um, well-known one is using Dex class loader. That's um, a way where you can just download an APK file, basically. You call a Java method and you have the code available. You can also load native code. So basically you download a Linux shared object and load it into your apps process. You can load code from other apps as we have seen for the shared framework. So you specify another app using its um, not so unique name and um, you get the code. And you can also install APKs. This is somewhat different from the rest though because it requires the user to consent. For the other techniques, there is no interaction with the user. They are just um, invisible. Now, as a developer of a benign app, there are various um, pitfalls that you have to be aware of. So one thing is the HTTP download that we saw for App Lovin. That's something you should not do, probably. Then what many apps do is they download the code via HTTPS. They authenticate stuff but they store the download on the SD card, which is world-writable, or at least in, in more recent Android versions, every app that has permission to write to the SD card can modify the downloaded file. And another problem, as we have seen for the unnamed framework, is that package names are not actually unique. So if you assume that your package name always maps to the code you expect, then that's a, a dangerous assumption. Now, how did we go about um, finding vulnerable applications? As I said, we used static analysis, the basis of which is AndroGuard. And AndroGuard gives us a control flow graph for the code. Now, we transformed the um, control flow graph into SSA, used some, uh, some class hierarchy recovery on that, and then um, basically used backward slicing. So the idea of backward slicing is that you identify a function call that you are interested in. Let's say create package context. That's the function you use to load code from an app by name. And um, you want to make sure that this, uh, this flags parameter 
is set to a specific value that tells the system to load code. Now, backward slicing means that you sort of go back in the call graph from this call to find out which value is assigned to the flex parameter. And that's what we did. So we wrote heuristics for all of the loading techniques that I mentioned on the previous slide and um, detected them using this backward slicing approach. Now usually static analysis gives you an over approximation. We designed the heuristics very carefully in a way that um, they only give us apps that are really vulnerable. I'm going to talk about the accuracy later, but um, the results are quite impressive. So what we found was that roughly 9% of the popular apps that we analyzed are actually vulnerable to one sort or another of uh, code injection. And um, the situation is the same among the top apps. So it's not just a problem of um, the not so popular apps, it's also something that happens with the most popular apps that have many millions of installs. So um, the tendency is, is alarming. There were more vulnerable apps in the, in the more recent top 50 set. And um, we also looked at, do we have a charger for this laptop? <laughs> we will. Awesome, thank you. Okay, let me just continue as long as I can. We looked at different motivations. So, so why are people actually using code loading techniques in their apps? And um, one, as I said already, is, oh yeah, awesome. Jeff, we have it. <laughs> Thank you. One motivation is um, loading updates. As I said, shared frameworks, we've also seen that. Some people want to do A-B testing or beta, beta testing. Um, until recently, Google Play did not offer um, a way for developers to do that, so they implemented their own mechanisms. There are even whole frameworks that allow you to do that. Or you might want to load add-ons that are installed as separate apps. So we came up with a sort of protection system, a suggestion what we can do. And essentially, well, you might know that um, iOS apps don't really have that sort of problem. And why is that? That's because iOS restricts you much more. Now, we don't want that sort of restriction in Android, but we still want the security. So our idea is that we want every piece of code that your device executes to be approved by some entity. But unlike in the iOS world, where everything has to be approved by Apple, we say there can be different entities and the user chooses which verification provider they want to trust. That's the essential idea. Basically, it's um, technically it's based on whitelists. If you think about it, then it's um, a whitelist is just a, a signature. So a list of signatures for apps. That's the, the essential idea. We implemented the whole thing on top of Android 4.3. And we implemented it as a modification of the Dalvik VM, that is the, the Java execution environment in Android. So um, the evaluation showed that the performance penalty is ex actually negligible. It's essentially a hash computation and a lookup. Um, but we have difficulties with, with native code that I'm going to go into shortly when we get to the limitations. So native code is one problem. Because um, our protection system is implemented in the Java runtime environment. The good, time about, uh, the good thing about um, Java is that if you want to load external code, you have to tell the environment that you want to do it. Once you load native code, you don't have to tell it anymore. So in native code, you can do all the nasty stuff that we know from, from PC. And um, it's very difficult to realize if native code is loading external code. So um, there is this idea to adapt Google Native Client. You might know that system. It um, was developed by Google to have a secure way of executing native code in browsers on the client side. For example, to, to run browser games in, with high performance, but in a secure way. The idea is to port this 
to Android. It is available for the ARM architecture already. And um, yeah, it's just a way to restrict the native code so that it cannot do any damage even if it is malicious. This is um, subject to ongoing research, so we hope to have results on that soon. Now another question is practicality. As I said, we modify the Java runtime in Android, which means that we modify the operating system. So you cannot just install this protection mechanism as another app. You have to actually update the operating system. And as such, we can only get um, wide acceptance of this system if Google accept it, accepts it and integrates it into the main source tree. This may or may not happen, so um, we're trying. Another concern that I want to mention is verification providers. So if these providers are to check every um, piece of code that a device loads, can they actually do that? And I think the answer is yes, because the, the guys that provide the app stores today already analyze every app that is submitted to the store. So um, you can also just um, analyze the updates in addition to that. So let me quickly conclude before we run out of time. We found on a large scale study of benign apps that around 9% are vulnerable to um, code injection because they use this Android feature of loading external code in an insecure way. We also said in the very beginning that malicious apps can use the feature to um, evade detection. And we tried to come up with a protection scheme that um, on one side prevents the exploits that we have seen, but on the, on the other side preserves the user's freedom. All right, that's it. And thank you for your attention. No questions? I'm afraid we don't have time for questions, so um, we can just talk offline. Thank you.